Hello, Sooner Nation, OU Insider subscribers, Coach Brian Clinton enthusiasts, people who are both excited about fall camp and also bummed about injuries that can happen in fall camp. This is certainly, indubitably, the podcast for you. This is another episode of the Oklahoma Drill, a podcast fueled by OU Insider and the Rivals Network. My name is Jesse Crittenden. I am joined, as always, by Brian Clinton. Brian, before we get into what I just teased, what did you think about not only the word indubitably, but also, are my intros getting better, worse, the same? You know, we've been doing this podcast for like a year now. Yeah, it's nuts. I'd like to know what episode this is. I, I'm sure it's underwhelming, but <laughs> we, we started. I want to say, I want to say we started the week of the SMU game. I think you're right. That sounds about right. Last year. Yeah. Let's. We need to go back and double check because we so need almost. To... Yeah, episode. Almost episode fifty, maybe. Then so we're like we haven't missed a week, right? I don't think so. I don't think we've missed a week. No. We need to check when. Yeah, yeah we, we should check, check when it's our year episode. Yeah, I agree. We do something, do something crazy for it. We uh, do. Yeah, they're getting, they're getting good, man. They're, I love the consistency. It's like, you know, exactly. I know exactly what I'm getting, and indubitably, three dollar word. That's a good deal. I, I like Thank that. You. One of my favorite words. Just like uh, last week, lampoon was the word. This week that is was, that was great. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, I say last week we recorded that on what Saturday. I'm gonna have to work in a, a hoot nanny somewhere along the way, but <laughs> love that word. Love hoot nanny. Um, <laughs> uh, what's uh Tom Foolery? Tom is Foolery. A That's a good one. Uh, rabble rousing. <laughs> um, Excellent. Brian. Also, and then uh, my other intro question to you is: injuries, good or bad? Bad. I hate I hate injuries, man. That's that's the that's one of the worst parts of the of the game. I, I hate that, but it is part of it, unfortunately. It is, and we might as well. Uh, you know, we're we're recording this on Wednesday, and we might as well uh, fill people in on what exactly we're talking about. And that is, um, there was um, a report on Tuesday about a knee injury. Um, suffered by OU wide receiver Jaden Gibson, um, I believe, during a Tuesday practice. Um, that uh, report was followed up on by our own Parker Thune. And um, we don't look. It's Wednesday. It hasn't even been 24 hours since that news came out. So we should clarify that this is nothing has been 100% confirmed. Um, but the fear is uh, there is going to be an MRI on Jaden Gibson's knee. And the fear is that this could be a significant injury and potentially a uh, an injury that could cause Jaden Gibson to miss the season. Um, I should also note that report was initially from Sooner Scoop and corroborated by us and Brian. Nothing's been confirmed, but this won't post until Friday morning. And I, I we're we're very confident in in Parker's reporting um, that. This is a serious injury, and we we have to talk about it because I mean we're a week into fall camp, and this is potentially a, a super significant injury. So uh, we need to break down what this means for him, what this means for the wide receiver room as a whole, what it means for the offense, what does it potentially mean for the ceiling of this team. But before we get into all of that stuff, I just want to ask you your initial thoughts on or just what was your initial thought when um especially with parker's reporting and also i'll just tell you straight up you know Jaden gibson's my guy yeah that's my guy yeah so i like to say i'm stealing this from eric bailey at the tulsa world don't root for teams that you cover but you root for players yeah really hard not to root for players and i root for that guy yeah. so if this is as it seems i'm personally saddened and disappointed how, what was your initial reaction? Um, very much the same. That, that is without a doubt, one of the, one of my favorite interviews. Um, he's always fun, always energetic, uh, always has a positive attitude. 
about things. And I think a lot of that maturity and growth that you saw last year and even going into the spring and summer portions for him, anytime he was in front of a microphone, you could really tell that he'd really taken on a leadership role in that room. And so, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, this really, this hurts. I mean, it, it's just, it, you hurt for the kid at, at the, at the end of the day, somebody that's put in the work, um, that he has somebody that really seemed to, to take care of their body this, this summer and, and came in looking ready to really contribute in a big way to this team. If this does end up being a serious injury, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's devastating for, for him now. Um, you know, the, the effects that that's going to have on the team is, is another conversation, but I think just for him personally, um, it's, it's all about how you attack the rehab with injuries like this. If this ends up being a serious injury again, it's all about how you attack that. And I, I would expect him to attack it head on. That's just how he seems to, to handle things. But initial reaction was, ah, dang it. Like, hate that for the kid because he's i mean he's just genuinely such a likable person uh, on top of being a good football player so it's hard not to root for a kid like that man and um and i think i agree with you i think he might be my favorite interview on the team he just has such a perspective on things and i think before we get into obviously because what do we do i mean what's what's our job brian we're, we're we dissect this team and how they play on the field and how things look yeah. But I don't want the 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 human element of this, um, and you can combine, or I don't want the human element to get lost. And you can combine it even with the on field potential. And the reality is, you know, Jaden Gibson had good moments last year, but all signs were pointed towards this being a huge year yeah. for Jaden, and that's disappointing because he's entering his third year. When and it almost considering his potential. And uh, the flashes he showed last year, this is typically that year two to year three jump. You know, this is when we see a guy that has as much potential as him. This is when we see them skyrocket. This is yeah. when we see them jump. He's been getting first team reps since the spring, man. And right. I think a lot of people, maybe even myself included, thought, well, maybe that's because Nick Anderson was dealing with an injury. That's because Angel Anthony's dealing with an injury. That's because Jalil Farouk got hurt. But look, what do we do when we get to fall camp? All of those guys are on the field. And who's getting the first, who's getting first reps? Shane Gibson. Yeah. And that was one of the things that stood out to me about open practice uh, on Monday, the, the portion that we got to watch, which we will break that down in a little bit. But Brian, the human element, the human element of it sucks, as we've talked about. But now let's talk about the on-field part of this. And I think it's going to be easy to look at his, his stats last year and say, I mean, yeah, he had some good moments, 14 receptions, five touchdowns, 375 yards. Um, good moments, but obviously wasn't the most productive wide receiver in the room. I think it's going to be easy for some people to look at that and think, well, this wide receiver class is loaded. This wide receiver group's loaded. They can handle this. I'm not saying I disagree with that because I don't, but this injury hurts. Mm. Not having him on the field hurts for a lot of different reasons. But let me ask you before I mention what's on my mind, what 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 kind of impact, what do you think this means for the wide receiver group? I think the best way to encapsulate the my reaction would be that the ceiling of the the ceiling of the room has been lowered. And I think that the floor of the room has been lowered. Um, now, again, there's still plenty of other guys out there, but what 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 Gibson brought to the table or brings to the table, again, nothing has been confirmed, so I, I need to not speak about it like it has been. But um, he's 6'5", 200 pounds. Very, very lengthy receiver, and he moves like he's about 15 pounds lighter than that and two inches shorter than that. Uh, he he moves very well, very fluid. Um, you could tell when he came in as a freshman, um, you know, he still had some of that, that lankiness. Um, 
very uh, not necessarily awkward, but you could tell that he was still growing into his body. And then uh, that we really saw that jump um, this off season. It felt like things became really fluid, and he he started to look like a dude. Um, and I think with what you saw, first team reps wise in practice, uh, what you saw from him in the bowl game, just as far as his snaps there. Uh, the staff now really, really likes what he brings to the table. And, and there's only, I mean, Ivan Carrion is the only guy on the team at that position that matches him size wise. Uh, and, and he's a true freshman. So I, you can't really expect him to come in and do exactly what, uh, what Gibson was going to do or was able to do. So I, I think what it does is it kind of takes your, it, it takes away the, the threat of, Oh, it's third and goal from the twelve yard line. We can throw the goal line fade to Gibson. He's going to go up and get it. Like, sure, you probably still have that option with a guy like Nick Anderson, but I think Gibson probably gave you a mismatch in that in that particular opportunity um, or situation where um, now it's a little less confident. So, I don't know. I, I think really at the end of the day. Um, he was set to be one of the main contributors there. And I, and at wide receiver, when you are going to have multiple players at a position out there at the same time, I think it's really easy to chalk it up as a room and not look at the individuals. But I think whenever you have three individuals out there at the same time that bring different things to the table, that's what makes a wide receiver room dangerous. Uh, and uh, that's just one less dynamic playmaker you have out there now. So I think it hurts. Um, there's other guys and they're going to have to step up. And, and I do think that if there was a position on the team that you could lose one of the top guys that's probably a receiver, but at the same time, uh, that doesn't take away from the fact that he was set to be a major contributor for this offense. I'm really glad you mentioned uh, the snap counts in the bowl game. Um, because I think it's important to remember that when it comes to players, there is so much is dependent on uh, the, your success is dependent on so many things. There are some players that can fit in some schemes that don't fit in others or mm -hmm. jive with some coaching staffs that don't with others. And I think it's pretty clear because you look at last year's snaps, he had a little over 230 snaps total. He finished, he had 60 fewer snaps than Angel Anthony, who missed more than half of the season, which is just a crazy thing to think about. But I never, and I've said this to you before, I never thought it was a coincidence that the only game he got more than 25 snaps was the bowl game, with the, fir the first game with Seth Luttrell on the sidelines calling plays. Jaden Gibson got 44 snaps in that game. He hadn't had more than 25 all year in a game. And so I think it's just – so when you're looking at it like, well, what what kind of impact he was going to have, I think it's possible he was going to fit in really, really well and better with Latrell in this scheme than he was going to with Levy in that scheme. Yeah. That's one. And two, I think it's – I think it's easy to – or like – yeah, because you're right. Because I think when you're looking at this from a – who else is in that room, it's easy to just say, well, look – now Nick Anderson is, you know, Nick Anderson, Jalil Farouk, and Dion Burks are the three guys you can go to um, as your starters now because that's how it was last year, especially after Angel Anthony got hurt. You just plug Dion Burks into the Drake Stoops role in the slot. You got Jalil Farouk coming back. You got Nick Anderson coming back. That's what you do. And maybe you figure out, maybe Angel Anthony gets one of those spots. He was a starter last year before he got hurt, all that stuff. But I think it's easy – for one, we don't know that that's what was going to happen. Maybe Jaden Gibson earned one of those starting spots. And two, I think it's easy to for, or like it's easy to just assume because Jeff Levy ran almost almost three wide sets, ex three wide receiver sets exclusively. Yeah, we probably were going to see more four and five wide receiver sets with Seth Luttrell. And because I mean, because now if you've got packages where you've got Dion. Jaden Gibson, Nick Anderson, Andrew Anthony, or Jalil Farouk, are all five of those guys on the field? That's a horrible thing for defenses to try to go against, yeah. you know? Or think about packages where Jaden Gibson would have fit in better than maybe any of those other guys. And then here's the other thing, Brian, is even if you still like the depth and the talent in that wide receiver room, which you should, which people should, even without Jaden Gibson, 
now you, I think it's always easy to forget that injuries can happen, which knock on wood, knock on wood. I'm knocking, mm -hmm. knock on wood. Angel Anthony got hurt during the middle of last season. Yeah. And now Nick Anderson was able to step up, but you injuries, as we just saw with Jaden Gibson, they're unpredictable. Right. And depth is one of those things that's really nice to have, but you can lose depth. Maybe a guy doesn't pan out. You know, there's, there's a lot of ways you can lose depth. So I am wondering, Brian, you mentioned Ivan carry on because here's the thing. And again, this is all mostly speculation because nothing's confirmed. What we saw last year when Angel Anthony got hurt was Nick Anderson basically took all of his snaps. Yeah. That's basically what happened. And Nick Anderson and Jalil Farouk and Drake Stoops took the vast majority of the snaps. But there were still, I mean, Jaden Gibson, even though he was the number five and then the number four wide receiver, still finished with 230 snaps. Even if you play your top four guys a lot of snaps, you're still going to need a fifth guy or maybe even a sixth guy. What if a fifth or sixth guy emerges and you need to make playing time for them? Is Ivan Carrion maybe the most equipped if, if OU needs that guy? Is he the most equipped guy to, to step in at that at that wide receiver Z position? Do you double down on your presumed top four of Anthony Anderson, Farouk, and Burks? Well, how do you how do you think OU steps through this? So I'm curious. I, I am curious to see how this ends up working out if he does indeed miss some time because you have a guy like JJ Hester, uh, who I guess I I kind of looked over him he's a red shirt senior and um a guy that transferred in from from missouri and that's a guy that that fits kind of that role as well size wise but i, I think what this does for me I, I think it opens up the door for a guy like jaquez petaway or a guy like zion kearney um guys that might not have had the opportunities that they would have. I, I think it kind of opens up the door for those guys. Somebody else that really could benefit from this is Brennan Thompson. Um, yeah. Now it's going to be, it's going to be different, right? Like the skill sets are just different, right? Like it, you're not going to put, if you put Brennan Thompson on the field at Z in the same uh, with the same playbook that you would have used or the same scheme that you would have used with uh, Gibson, he's probably not going to be able to replicate some of the things that, that Gibson did. But vice versa, you're also going to be able to stretch the field with a guy like Brennan Thompson, maybe a way that you wouldn't have. Not to say that, that Gibson's not incredibly fast because he is, but I, I mean, Brennan Thompson is just, uh, he's a track star. So um, I, I think it just changes the way that you're going to have to do things. Now, if it is end up being a big injury, um, it happened early in camp. So that gives you an opportunity to kind of figure some things out before game reps start happening. But I mean, the reality of this is going into the season against Temple Tulane and Houston or Temple Houston. Tulane. Temple Houston -Tulane. Anyway, yeah. Temple Houston Tulane. Um, those first three games, you're going to be figuring things out. And so there's time to figure it out. I, I just think what it does is, is you're already going to have rotation. I, I, you know, that's a, that's a position where you're probably going to have six, seven, eight guys a game playing, just, just rotating. Uh, and so uh, it, it's going to in increase the snaps for somebody that was on the fringe there. Um, but yeah, it does. It definitely eliminates some of the things that you can do offensively. And this, staff obviously really liked him. He was taking first team snaps uh, in a group of wide receivers that we've all said was potentially the best room in the country. Um, you know, and, and I think with him out, it, it definitely uh, hinders that claim uh, pretty, pretty significantly. So. I, I like the Brennan Thompson idea mostly because, I mean, I think the thing you miss, cause you mentioned his size and length, uh, Jaden Gibson size and length and man if you stand next to him you really get a sense of like oh like this dude is just tall and yeah. lanky yeah. you know um the one thing that OU is really gonna miss is that I mean Jaden Gibson was probably their biggest 
Um, not their fastest guy. That's probably Brennan Thompson, but he's probably, he was probably their biggest downfield threat in terms of being able to catch contested yep. balls. You know, he's, he's probably, he probably presents the most, the most mismatches, but he yep. averaged 27 yards a catch last year. Right. Yep. He's a one-on-one nightmare. Yeah. And the only guy that averaged more yards per catch than him on the team was Brennan Thompson, who is fast, but also only played 30 snaps last year. Right. So I do wonder if this forces to get the coaching staff to get more creative with how they do things, because maybe they had, I I think it's very possible they were coming up with packages centered around getting Jaden Gibson mismatches on the perimeter. 100%. So now I wonder the, the reality is, this is kind of an unknown because if this was still the Jeff Levy system and we know we can look at the snap counts and say, he really kind of likes to play three guys yeah, and then give a like 10, like disperse the 10% remaining snaps to a couple other guys, mm-hmm. but he really likes to play three. And we kind of knew how Jaden Gibson fit in that pecking order. But now with a new offensive coordinator, it's just a little bit more unpredictable in terms of how things would have shaken out. If Jaden Gibson was healthy again, speculation they don't know anything for sure. right i do think the, the the most objective thing you can say and i kind of said this on our board but the most objective thing you can say is ou has the depth and talent in that wide receiver room to withstand this injury that's the good news and there's still four guys at minimum proven productive elite options the downside is this, you mentioned it. The ceiling of the offense takes a little bit of a hit. The versatility of the offense takes a little bit of a hit. And your depth, just by default, takes a little bit of a hit. The last question I have is, I do wonder, and maybe not, but I do wonder if this is as feared. I do wonder if it, does it maybe, does it maybe put someone like Zion Kearney or Ivan Carrion or another, like a young guy, does that put them on the field more? And does that potentially change plans the coaching staff would have had to redshirt a guy? Or, you know, like I do wonder if it has that impact too. Yeah, I think it, you know, that's definitely a possibility, especially if, you know, I just, I would like to, I, I wish I could just ask Seth Luttrell, like what, how he and Joe John Finley are going to go about this because, I mean, you either, a have your system and recruit guys to that system and that's how you're going to do it or you do build packages around players like like Gibson which i think he is the kind of talent where you you have things like that so if that is the case then you're going to have to give opportunities to a guy like uh Ivan Carrion or Hester or um like you said uh, Zion Kearney one of those younger guys um that that maybe otherwise was going to get a year to uh, kind of mature, but now he's going to have to be thrown in the fire just because, uh, you know, the, the depth's taking a hit. And I think that that's another, like you mentioned earlier, um, when's the last time, when's the last time Oklahoma went or, or any team went through, uh, an entire season without one of their wide receivers sustaining some sort of, of nick or bruise or, or, or cut or, you know, whatever it is that caused them to miss some time. Um, it's just part of the game. And so uh, I, I think the, the thing that I wanted to bring up before we transition is something that we haven't talked about, something I haven't seen a lot of people talk about, but I do think it's worth mentioning is I really noticed in the spring um, he was one of the guys that wasn't afraid to get dirty as a, as a blocker on the perimeter either. Like, and and I think that that's something that's like a mentality thing, uh, especially at that position. And so you're going to have to find somebody that is not only willing but able to be as effective as as he was on the perimeter. Because I expect Oklahoma to spread the field uh, okay. sideline to sideline still, but maybe use those. Um, those wide splits with the receivers to, you know, make more running lanes uh, this year with maybe some more um, planned runs rather than RPO stuff, just, just more uh, than we saw last year. And so I think that that's something else. It affects that as well, uh, because that's, that's something that he was proficient in uh, and and certainly looked like he uh, had really 
grown comfortable doing that, uh, especially throughout the spring. So, uh, yeah, it hurts. I'm glad you mentioned that because that is, I mean, again, like I think it's easy from a, from an outside perspective to say, why isn't this guy getting playing time or why is this guy's getting too much playing time blocking as a wide receiver is what, like some coaches value that more than others. And that's very possible. That was part of why he was getting more playing time. I, I, I think all of this to sum up, I'll just say this now. And again, nothing's confirmed. We've said that a million times. If this is as feared, this puts a dent in what was going to be one of my final preseason predictions before the season started, which was I was actually going to predict that Jaden Gibson finishes in the top three in snaps at wide receiver. And I was actually going to predict that he, fit, that he led the team in touchdowns. Yeah. Those are going to be my two predictions. I would have, I would have agreed with you on, on probably both of those. Yeah. Unfortunately. So it's it's tough it's no doubt tough but we've we have rightfully lauded this wide receiver room for months now and this is this is now this is the test to see how much depth and talent there really is in that room i think there is enough to withstand it but it's a blow it's definitely a blow brian before we talk about um some of uh some of the open practice observations from monday um first need to read a word from our sponsor, our sponsor, God, sponsor. And that is Babel. You know, the best way to learn a new language, Brian, do you know? What's it's, that? it's immersion, which is living where the language is spoken, mm. but that's not really in the cards for most of us. Fortunately for you or anybody else out there, there's another way that you can learn a language, the second best way. And that's with Babel. One in five Americans have learn a new language on their bucket list. You can do that certainly with Babbel. It is an online service with all kinds of lessons, all kinds of ways to really immerse yourself in a new language. Be a better you in 2024 with Babbel, the science-backed language learning app that actually works. Don't pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick. 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel's Babbel is designed by real people for real conversations. Its tips and tools are approachable, accessible, rooted in real-life situations, and delivered with conversation-based teaching to show that you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. Here's a special limited-time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription but only for our listeners at babble.com slash OU insider. That's 60% off at babble, B A B B E L.com slash OU insider. Rules and restrictions may apply. Brian, as I mentioned, we're recording this on Wednesday, and we got to attend just a 20 minute open portion of practice on Monday. Definitely um, a shorter practice time or a practice session than we have gotten with Brent in the past 20 minutes is just about enough time to make you feel like you were at practice more or less. Um, cause like 10 minutes of it is stretching. <laughs> um, but we did get to glean some interesting things. And, um, before I talk about those couple of things, I actually would have said here that Jaden Gibson's continuing to get first team reps smirk. um, so can't talk about that, but uh, let's look at the running back room. That's one of the biggest areas um, that I think has been discussed so far. Um, Gavin Sawchuk reasonably, pre- predictably getting first team reps, practicing a lot with Jaden Gibson. Brian, there's a co- there's a couple of running backs outside of Sawchuk that have really kind of taken the discussion. That's Javante Barnes and Taylor Tatum, your guy, Taylor Tatum. There's a lot of buzz about Taylor Tatum, man. He's quick. He's quick as hell. He's explosive. I actually think he's probably the most explosive guy in that running back room. I mean, yesterday was the, or yesterday, Monday was the first time we actually got to see him on the field. Yeah. He's a summer enrollee. So he's been a little bit of a hard guy to project because we didn't get to see him in the spring. Um, I don't know, Brian. I, there's, I think there's still a lot of stuff to figure out with that running back room, but Taylor Tatum, man, I think it's possible he plays a role, maybe like passing downs. Uh, you know, I don't know how big that role is going to be, but that was the first thing Jackson Arnold 
mentioned was his impact in the passing game. I know you've done a lot of video breakdown on him. Any of this surprise you just how much of a quick impact he's made and, and how realistic do you think is some kind of role for him in 2024? Yeah, it's not, it's not surprising. That was one of the guys on my list in last week's um, yeah. draft, but I will say, you know, the, the point that you made about um, him being at a little bit of a hindrance for being late to the party, that, that is going to play a role. I mean, it always does. Um, if, if you, if you don't have the experience, if you don't know exactly what's going on on every play, I mean, it, it's going to be hard to get on the field for DeMarco Murray. That's just the, that's just the case. We saw that last year. Um, so I'm, I am curious to see what it looks like, but there is, there is no doubt that is a, that's a guy that has probably the highest ceiling in the room when it comes to what he could end up being um, at that position. He can do it all. He's got he's got the tools to be you're between the tackles uh, running back. He's got the tools to be a threat out of the out of the backfield as as Arnold uh, kind of talked about there. Uh, but he's also somebody that is an absolute nightmare whenever he's in open space. So. Um, he kind of brings he brings the best of Caleb Hicks, Gavin Sawchuck, and Javante Barnes together, if that makes sense. Like he has probably the the best of those qualities. He brings all of those into one into one piece. So he's an all purpose guy. Um he's he's the closest thing Oklahoma has had to a true all purpose running back since Joe Mixon. I mean, that's that's not to take anything away at all from from what they have and the other guys what they've had in in Gavin Sawchuck what they've had in Javante Barnes but um I think when you look at a total uh the tool belt that he brings um he's got it all so I'm I'm excited to see what he what he can do uh in this offense because I think the transition to um a little more called runs is going to be uh very welcome for for him so I do like that, and I'm excited to see what he does. He makes fast people look not fast, to quote the longest yard. Um, that running back room is going to be interesting, man. Um, Javante Barnes, he was one of the – I mean, he's – I think you always, from a, from a reporter perspective, it's always interesting to see which guys you get to talk to first. And uh, Javante Barnes was on the so – we got to talk to four players last week, and then the second day we got to talk to players after practice on Monday – Javante Barnes was one of those guys, one of the four guys. It was Javante Barnes, Jackson Arnold, uh, Gentry Williams, and Jacob Sexton. Um, God, that running back room is going to be such a battle, man. Um, Caleb Hicks, from the, from the portion I saw, Caleb Hicks was getting a lot of the second team reps, but I think Barnes, there's real momentum with Javante Barnes. I think Taylor Tatum is impressed. I mean – that's going to be interesting. I think what's even more interesting, Brian, is the offensive line starting group or the presumed starting group from what I could see. Jacob Sexton. Um, why I, oh, my God. Sorry. It was Jacob Sexton, Branson Hickman, Keith Ozeda, Fabechi Nawewu. Ozeda or Ozeda? Ozeda. Okay. Oh. I, well, I'm not one to question how to mention it, how to say names because I still can't say number 34's name on defense and I'm not going to try it right now, but PJ, yeah, PJ works. PJ, PJ works. Um, uh -huh. but anyways, yeah. So it was, sorry. It was Jacob Sexton at left tackle. Heath Ozida at left guard. Yep. Branson Hickman at center. Fabetchi Nwewu at right guard and Jake Taylor at right tackle. And I think the name that's going to draw the most attention reasonably. So is, is Ozida. At that left guard spot. Yeah. Not a forgotten guy. Wouldn't say he's forgotten, but there's real mo there's real momentum for him to be a starter, Brian. Like that's he's going to be in the mix. He he is. And I think he could start. Is that surprise you're the offensive line guy? Is that's is that surprising to you at all? I remember talking to him last year as a true freshman at Media Day in the spring, I believe. Yeah. Whenever they uh it was it was an uh I think it was in May, whenever it was. Anyways, it was it was whenever we finally got an opportunity to talk to some of those guys. And I just remember his, um, you know, once we got past the talks about the difference between Summers in Oklahoma and in Washington, 
Um, I, I think we really got a chance to see kind of like what his mindset was, how he was uh, transitioning into playing under uh, Bill Beanbo and really loved the mindset that he had. Uh, just seemed like he had the the right stuff whenever it comes to competitive, being competitive, but also being willing to learn, um, being totally on board with, hey, I'm a freshman and there's a lot I can learn from these older guys. Uh, and it doesn't surprise me at all that he has has come into that uh, and and really pushed for that that spot because I I think a lot of people just assumed uh, myself included that you know Garen Hatchett or um, you know somebody somebody else would take up that it would be a, a, a senior or a transfer somebody like that uh, that would that would come in and really grab that spot and for Ozida that's that's a great that's a really really good thing. For Oklahoma, um, if that is what happens, if he is, if he trots out there against Temple and he's your starter at at left guard, that is really good news for Oklahoma because he's a redshirt freshman. Um, he's a guy that uh, can get used to playing right there next to to Sexton, uh, and is somebody that you can uh, kind of count on being there alongside Fabechi Mwiwu if you know, if all things go well this year, that gives you another guy that can return next year and, and be a starter for this team going forward. So I like it. I think it's a good thing. Um, you know, obviously you want to use those transfer pieces that you got, right? Like that's, I mean, that's, that's why you brought them in, but, uh, I think you would always rather have a young guy that is growing into, um, a multi-year starter than maybe a plug and play, uh, bandaid, if you will. So I, I like that. Uh, I really am excited that he is, is, is kind of making that, that interesting. So it'll be fun to watch, see, uh, what things look like towards the end of fall camp. It's wee woo. My gut, my default when I'm just rushing, when I'm speaking is to say no way woo and it's wee woo. You want to know how I remember it's wee woo? I remember the, it's the ambulance sound from from SpongeBob, or whenever he's on the, he's on the <laughs> Patrick's on the on the mic. Wee woo wee woo. <laughs> All the people who are exactly our age will yeah. get that. I think that it's funny. Anybody younger or older will not think it's funny. Correct. Yeah. You know what? Okay with me. Forget you guys. <laughs> I've actually SpongeBob has been been quoting SpongeBob in a normally large amount recently. Yeah, that's that's a that's a mainstay for me. Uh, I'm sure my girlfriend loves it a ton. Uh, Leak, ma'am. <laughs> <Finland. laughs> oh god. Uh, it does look like I think Jacob Sexton and Jake Taylor are are essentially locked in at your tackle spots. I agree. Yep. That that's sounds cool. about right. And I think Branson Higman's locked in as your center, and and Wee Woo's probably locked in at one of those guard spots. Yep. I think it's really awesome because that means that means your your depth pieces are Michael Tarquin, uh, Garen Hatchett, uh, Troy Everett whenever he gets healthy, which sounds like he's kind of ahead of schedule a little bit from what we thought, uh, and Spencer Brown. So that's I mean that's. That's solid. That's really, really good. Um, if if those are your guys that are coming in to to kind of help, I, I would say, no offense to Caleb Schaefer whatsoever. Um, I feel really good about that being your second line, your your second line of defense there, um, compared to what they've maybe had the last couple of years. Be it'd be pretty cool and pretty crazy if we thought about how much uh, pressure there was for OU to get reinforcements on the O line, and then if the week one starters are three guys that OU signed yep. out of high school, yep, hmm. a redshirt like, freshman and two third year guys. Like Bill Beanbo knows what he's doing. <laughs> um. So I mean, I do. I mean, again, nothing set in stone, but I mean, I would. I would. I, outside of that one guard spot, Nozida might have it. Yep. Uh, I think you've got your four starters. And, I mean, Brent Venables specifically mentioned Jake Taylor and Jacob Sexton, their their development, particularly as leaders, over the last few months. Um, 
I think that's heavily, it would be heavily encouraging if that's the case. Absolutely. Um, defensively, I'm just going to say this, that defensive line actually looks as specific, specifically the D tackles actually looks like a D tackle room. Now they actually look like, like they're not know. doing yoga and I mean, okay. No, okay. Look, Never mind. <laughs> now let's, let's get this out of the way. Anybody that plays D one football is much stronger and bigger and faster and more athletic than you and I and 99.9% of the population. Having said that, it's clear that there has been a lack of, I don't know what the right word is. Physicality? Let's say physicality. That D tackle room has not been able to compete against other big boy programs the last few years. Yep. I think they're going to be able to compete, man. I do too. Um, John Terry is massive. Um, looks bigger than last year. Dominic Williams just looks like, a, oh, yeah, he's going to come in and be really good. This is what he looks like. I'm going to have a feature on him later this week. I talked to his um, I talked to his mom who told me some really great stories and some interesting tidbits about uh, his journey to OU. Um, he's going to make an impact. And, I mean, Jaden Jackson looks good. David Stone looks good. Nigel Smith looks good. Grayson Halton looks good. Champ Sanders looks good. Um, everybody looks good. It's everybody looks good season. I know, but um, D tackle room is noticeably bigger, noticeably more impressive. Uh, more beef is good on the defensive line. Like that's what you want. And I, I love looking at the depth chart and seeing three twenty three, three oh nine, three fifteen. Like seeing all of these three plus and it not just being on the offensive side of the ball along the offensive line. It is, you've got to be heavy like that. That's, I, I just, I don't know where that ever went astray. I mean, I do know where it went astray, but I, I, it's been that way for a hundred years and, um, Oklahoma is getting back to having some of those guys that are incredible athletes at that, at that position, because you, I, I think what, I think there's a I, I think there's maybe some confusion uh to to maybe like the general public or maybe a just a, a regular fan uh who's just coming in and watching football uh without thinking about it. Those guys, yes, they're they're big. Um they weigh a lot, but a lot of times those are your most impressive athletes on the field. Like if you have a good defensive tackle room, those guys are way more athletic than you ever realize because they have that mass and they're able to move it as quickly or quicker than guys way, way lighter than them. So, um, yeah, those having, having the level of athlete that they do in that room now is, is really exciting. I think it's really going to elevate that side of the ball. Football is a very complicated game with all kinds of schemes and and all kinds of things that affect an outcome of a game and what happens on the field. When it comes to the line of scrimmage, sometimes it is as simple as when you looked at OU playing Georgia, Bama, and LSU in the playoffs and going, oh, those teams are just way bigger. Than yep. Them. Oh, boy. The uh, the game of inches, it uh... – that's around the gut too. That really, it makes a difference when you've got yeah. big boys. So it's, I mean, you just don't want, I mean, it, sometimes it is, a, I'm not saying that's the only thing. It, obviously it's not the only thing you need to win, but you don't want, OU going to the SEC thinking. And every time they, they take the field against an SEC opponent going, man, they just, they just don't have the size. Right. They just don't. Yeah. I don't or, think that's going to be, it's still a work in progress, but I don't think that's going to be as much of an issue this year. I just yeah. don't. I agree. Um, more often than not, I, I think that's probably the best way of, of of saying it. More often than not, the bigger team wins in the line of scrimmage. Like that's more often than not, um, you're going to win that tug of war. And so having bigger athletes there, uh, it certainly helps. The other thing that I think is worth it to mention is, I mean, uh, Farouk and, and Angel Anthony were on the field. They, they did have braces on, but they were on the field and looked good to me. I honestly thought I was going to see them be limited 
or one of them be limited. Um, especially, you know, cause I don't think either of them are technically a hundred percent. Um, they're on the field. I think they're going to be ready for week one. I don't, I don't think that's really a question. Um, there's a few other guys off to the side, like Marcus strong and, um, you know, Patterson McDonald, a couple of the freshmen. Uh, it was really exciting to see out there. Like it just, it was just an awesome, like one of those feel good stories. Caden Helms, Caden sure. Helms is out Kaden there Helms. practicing. I love that. I, That's how... I really hope that that ends up uh, being somebody that can, can stay on the field and, and contribute. No, I agree. And with him and, and Bauer Sharp and, and Jake Roberts, I mean, that tight end group is also. And Devon Mitchell. Devon Mitchell. Yeah. They just look more impressive. Um, Desan McCullough was on a scooter with a huge brace on. Um, but, um, again, I think there's real optimism. He's not going to be out that long. And it was, um, Kip Lewis getting LB one reps next to Stutzman. Kip Lewis does look bigger. Yeah. Looks a lot bigger. Um, again, it's hard to know how much McCullough's injury puts a, a, or not a dent, but how much that impacts things. Mm-hmm. Um, but Kip Lewis looks bigger and I think it's, I think it's, it's McCullough and, and Lewis pretty clearly in the top two at that spot next to Stutzman. Yeah. Um, and I think that's encouraging that Lewis, that Kip Lewis looks significantly bigger. Um, but man, I mean, I would say, and again, it was only 20 minutes of an open practice, but I would say, I would say the most interesting position groups to watch moving forward would be, um, Running back, D tackle, um, and I'm gonna say cheetah because I mean there, there's there's stuff to watch everywhere. What happens at wide receiver? What happens at tight end? O line, but because um, even I, I got to watch the DNs for a second, and it was it was Ethan Downs and R. Mason Thomas getting the first reps. Yeah, but and then Peyton Willard and Trace Ford getting second reps. But that wasn't in a scrimmage setting. This was a, it's just individual drills. Right. Hoping we get a couple more practices to really see if we can glean more from it. Do you have anything you're watching for or any questions in particular? Uh yeah, I'm I'm excited to see what happens at corner. Um I know Woody Washington's the guy there and Gentry Williams. I mean, sure, that's everybody knows that those are probably your first two trotting out there, but um behind them at some point you're going to have to have some other guys on the field and I'm excited to see who it is behind those guys. Uh, when, when the time comes, I know Des Malone, somebody that I was really excited about in the spring, uh, would assume that he's going to be one of those. I would, I would guess right now that he's probably your number three. Um, but a guy like Jacoby Johnson, um, what, uh, I've drawn a blank, um, Ari Vickers. Of, yes, Vickers uh, is another one that I was curious about. Um, yeah, I, I just want to know what that looks like because I think in in the SEC, particularly against teams like Ole Miss and Missouri, and then obviously Alabama and LSU, you're going to be matched up with some mismatched, some nightmares at wide receiver. I mean, Luther Burden. Um, LSU always has a guy. Uh, so there's going to be Trey Harris for, for Ole Miss. Um, there are going to be some some guys that you really need to be able to stick with one-on-one, and and uh, I think those are going to – those guys are going to have a lot on their plate. So it'll be interesting to see who, who comes out in, in that uh, portion of things. But I think outside of that, yeah, uh, Cheetah is, is, is another spot, um, especially with what we saw from them to end the year. Um, really excited about that group too. That's going to do it for us here on this latest edition of the Oklahoma drill. Uh, we're in the midst of fall camp and plenty of stuff, plenty of stuff going on, plenty of stuff to talk about. We're going to surely have more open practices, uh, more availabilities, uh, more things to figure out about this year's team. The place you want to do that. And if you want to learn the most about OU football is here at OU insider, make sure you like, and subscribe to this OU insider YouTube channel. Head on over to OUinsider.com, uh, become a VIP member today. I mean, we're we're less than we're less than four weeks out from the start of the season. No better time to get started than right now. But as always, thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Oklahoma Drill.
me and Brian will see you next time.